This is Elizabeth, day two. Oh, here she comes. Like, what are all of these little exercises we're doing and what do they mean and how do they help and all of that? I still have a lot to learn, but here's what I understand so far. As far as the human brain goes, we, as it grows and develops, there, there's a couple of different, I guess, laws that really govern how our brain functions. And one of those things is the function determines the structure. So like when a child learns well, let me back up. Like when, when you go to the gym, if you go to the gym, which you probably don't like me, but let's just pretend that we do. You go to the gym and you're doing a rep, like a curl, you're curling it up. And when you do that, you build the muscle because you're doing a function and the function is pulling that curl up, pulling that dumbbell up. And when you do that, you almost require of that muscle that it build and, and you actually tear it, right? You tear it and you rip it and it gets bigger, which determines the structure of the muscle that you have on your arm and it gets more shape and it gets more tone and bigger, right? Hopefully. And the brain works in a similar way where what we are doing with our bodies, with our intellect, with how we're speaking and hearing and drinking the world and around us as well as what we're putting out into the world determines how our brain is shaped and or, or structured I guess I should say and so for my kids when they didn't learn to crawl properly or crawl on their stomach or use their words or anything like that it changed the structure of their brain and it became disorganized in a sense so that they didn't know how to speak, right? And this is also assuming that the issues that they're having is neurological, but a physical ailment can also interfere with this. So if you have, you know, like when your arm is broken and it's in a cast, the muscles that are there atrophy. Different aspects of our brain atrophy if it's not used. And if you have a physical ailment that inhibits you from doing specific movements or seeing or hearing or other things like that, the brain structure, it, it, it is not structured to accomplish those tasks. So, but when you have a neurological deficiency or learning disability, you can teach the brain by requiring different movements that then change the structure of the brain. And the structure meaning the pathway that the neurons are firing, right? The neurons in our brain are small cell, cells, and I'm not gonna get, I guess, too deep into, because I'm not like an ex expert, but this is what I understand. The cells in our brains are called neurons, and those neurons connect in very specific pathways with specific instructions on how to do specific things, remember specific things, etc., etc. So what we do or feel or think fire off neurons in our brain, fire off very specific pathways, and we do that over and over and over again. So what we're doing with our kids in right now doing the physical, this will happen globally as we, because all of these therapies are designed to retrain the brain, to heal the brain through nutrition, to reorganize the brain through physical uh, mobility, and then to give the brain more input and more information to organize, which will then give our kids the ability to have an output of speaking in this case. So that's what a lot of these, these things are designed to do is to reorganize the brain and help it to request of it a different structure. So that's why these, um, and I, I don't know the science behind it, but I do, I've talked to different parents that have gone through this program and actually like randomly the the guy that helped me at the um at the hardware store hardware store he his daughter was born very early and uh prematurely was in the ICU or whatever but they were in Germany in the healthcare at the time and healthcare in in the NICU they I forgot the name of it. I wrote it down so I have to look it up. But it's a specific kind of therapy where they use pressure points that, that help the kids move their body in a certain way. Even, even though that, because they're not doing it voluntarily or naturally, which is what most kids do. But these preemies don't. And so they would do this specific therapy to help the kids mimic crawling or do other physical things that they wouldn't do before, which allowed them to 
wire their brain when they're when they were in a state where they couldn't do it independently and this guy's daughter is now nine years old I mean obviously they live in the states now but they she's like trying out for volleyball she's dancing she's very coordinated very like you wouldn't know that she was born very prematurely and was in the NICU and or any of that and so it just seemed I guess my, my point is is it seems strange that these little exercises would do anything but they are and so I don't know I just I don't know how you argue with that for me so why not give it a try and that's why we're doing it so and I don't know specifically what like what crawling on the belly organizes or anything I just know that for them it is attached to reorganizing the mid brain and if you don't know what the midbrain in, you have like your, your brain stem, and then you have, uh, oh, I think it's called the pons, and then you have the medulla, and then you have the midbrain. And it's just like how the brain is being built up from the base, and you're going up in levels. And the higher up in levels you go, the more sophisticated the function of the brain, right? And then above the midbrain is the, um, the cortex, but there's another name for it, like the frontal lobe and the whole cortex and all that jazz which is a lot of our logic, reasoning, in intelligent things. But in the midbrain, oh, a hummingbird, how pretty. Right, in the midbrain is more of our survival and our, uh, like the basic things, the structure of our brain. And so um, right now our kids need that. And so for some reason doing these exercises reorganizes that midbrain. So, and it's like all the basic things that your babies do during tummy time. So tummy time is very, very, it's very critical and very important. So like I've been getting down on my belly and I've been crawling around with them and doing these things and it's interesting what muscles I've forgotten to use or that have become weak because I haven't been doing these things in a while and it feels good to like get, get down and, and do all this stuff with them. So like when we spin them around in the chair, that helps with the, the vestibular system in the brain, which is the um, balancing and different things like that. And when my kids spin, you know, when you take your, if you have a little baby or your little child or a niece or nephew, you, you spin them and then you stop and their eyes go, and they still like track back and forth and back and forth. And that's because they haven't quite figured out how to, how to steady their world, right? And this has a lot to do with why my kids are so unsteady when they're walking right now. And I experienced this when I was dancing because they would have you spot something and you turn and you turn and you turn and initially you just got so dizzy so fast. But after practicing over and over and over again, you were able to do tons of spins and then stop and you could regain your focus and you weren't dizzy and you didn't feel like your world was falling down, right? And we, we see this with athletes, with ice skaters, with ballerinas, with other people that are spinning. Why? This is why... Um, gymnasts or other people can do flips and turns and know where they are in space and and land and on their feet after like doing a bazillion flips in the air you know or trampoline trampolinists I don't know the name for that but they can do the same thing so that's a big part of like spinning in the chair you know and then being able to do um, crossing over patterns because the, the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and vice versa. So being able to do that crossover helps the brain communicate more quickly so they don't have lag in their response time, right? Which my kids have, you ask them a question and they're like, what? You know, so <laughs> to help them reorganize that and create a stronger pathway so that they can communicate quicker is the hope, right? Yes! Oh. Yes! You did it! Good boy! Yeah. Oh yeah! Play is critical for children and then seeing your face and having excitement. This is the work of childhood and all of it is developing the human brain. So it's all very important. They're not just playing right this is the work of childhood it's growing and it's developing and it's organizing that brain that then benefits them for the rest of their life so that is a big part of this therapy nutrition which is what I'm delving into the human body is like the grow bed or the box or the soil for the brain 
and it's it is the soil that the brain is planted in and so what we eat how we exercise and the toxins that we're exposed to or not exposed to all influence the quality of the soil that our brain is drawing its nutrients from uh, like keeping healthy blood is like that water that we pour into a garden um, and keeping healthy organs, different aspects that we put into the soil. Do we have all the vitamins and minerals that the soil needs to grow healthy plants? Same thing with the brain. Now for my children, they have a high probability and Elizabeth does because of her genetic variations, um, because of her genetic mutation, she is more susceptible. That's like the difference between getting a very resilient plant, like a tomato or a pepper, and you're growing that. Those are like that they'll grow, a plant that'll just grow anywhere. It's like you don't even have to pay attention to it. It grows, it's resilient, and you have those kinds of kids. But then you have other plants, like specific herbs, um, that are very temperamental, right? They need just the right amount of sunlight and just the right amount of, amount of, um, of, of nutrients and just the right kind of soil and just the right amount of water. And if they get attacked by aphids or other bugs, it just destroys them, right? And they, they don't, the, the plant doesn't have the what do they call it, the constitutional resilience to withstand that on, it own, on its own. Um, but it can produce like amazing tasting food. And so that's why we make an effort to, to put the work into helping that plant grow and helping that plant be healthy. And once you get it down and you understand that plant, then it's easier to keep it healthy. I feel like my kids are the same way. I have one child, my oldest son, Michael, who is resilient. Like he could, you know, raise himself. He can be exposed to a lot of things, a lot of situations, and he is resilient and he'll learn from it and he's a go-getter. And I feel in my younger two kids that they have that same kind of spirit, but they have genetic and constitutional vulnerabilities where they need specific foods. They need to not be exposed to toxins because of how much it influences and I guess hurts their body and their brain. And so for them, the nutritional aspect of this program is forming the perfect greenhouse environment for them to grow and develop. And then hopefully at some point teaching them that so that they can maintain that for themselves. And I feel that they will bring to the table of foods, if you will, of life, something beautiful and savory and delicious, just like a lot of those very temperamental, temperamental plants do, right? They, they need extra care. And it's very possible that a lot of us with children that have special needs fall into that category where there is a lot, there's healing for them, but they're a different kind of plant. They're a different kind of child where they need extra things and different things to help them function and that there's nothing wrong with that. They're just a different kind of plant, right? They're not, they're not a pumpkin plant and you can't, you can't turn a pumpkin plant into a tomato plant just because you think it would be easier to raise tomatoes, you know? So we as mamas get to figure that out and get to cultivate this garden of children that we have and, and figure out what their seed is, right? Their genetics, their other vulnerabilities and then figure out what they need for healing and growth um, with those vulnerabilities. Elizabeth, you want some juice? Mom. Yeah. Me? Is there juice for me too? Yeah. What? Do you want to try your juice? No. No? Do you want me to get juice for me? Yeah. Oh, okay. I can get some juice too. How's the juice? Yeah. Good. And I remember for a long time I was very overwhelmed. Just debilitatingly overwhelmed. Mostly when I was first learning about Elizabeth. About how to do this. Because I didn't know what to do and I didn't know where to go. And a lot of doctors, well they weren't even really paying attention to me or offering me hope at all. And so it was just devastating. And coming across a different way of thinking. It's just viewing the world a different way through the lens of possibility, through the lens of, hey, there is actually healing for a lot of these kids and we don't know to what extent they will, they will grow. 
whether they will learn to talk or not or walk or not or all those things but we do know that if we can cultivate what they need and just let them grow then they can decide how far they want to go instead of the medical field or modern science telling us what our children can or cannot do.